make sure everything is working. And we should be starting on the stream. And let me see. Are you, yep, you say we're live. Okay, so the stream is live. So welcome everyone to the November, what is it, 13th Apple Cider meeting. Um, 10 after, not too bad. See, every month we try to get uh, closer and closer to um, being on time. And the stream says it's live, but I don't see the link showing up. want to use that. I don't want to use the live control room because it doesn't work the way I want it to. Alrighty, so oops, that's not the window we want. I want to go back to this window and hide it here. I can't do 16 things at once anymore. I'm getting too old. Yeah. There we are. There's the live. So we are live streaming. Let me make sure the audio is working. I can hear myself. <laughs> Welcome to everyone who is watching. There is someone watching online. Welcome. We had, uh, who was it, Charlie's was in uh, North Carolina, was it? He said he uh, had a couple of people that were interested in uh, in streaming, so maybe uh, Charlie's watching. So, um, any guests tonight, other than our main speaker? <laughs> so pretty much everyone knows how things work, uh, Apple Starter Users Group. Um, tonight's meeting, we're going to be uh, doing some news and Q&A. Um, and um, since there's a lot of news, uh, we may not uh, have too much to, to talk about on our holiday panel. Um, but uh, uh, sort of keep in mind, if anyone has any things to, uh, uh, to talk about coming up for the holidays, uh, we'll be talking about that. Uh, and then we have Miriam Henry, um, Marion, right? <laughs> Marion with an N. <laughs> well, start with an M, end with an N. So <laughs> uh, from the Rochester Genealogical Society is going to be talking about genealogy. Um, our Saturday SIGs have been postponed. Bob is going to be out of town on Saturday. Yeah, Bob, uh, Bob was uh, uh, saying if anyone's interested to come by on Sunday, uh, give him a call, and um, uh, we can do a meeting on Sunday. Next Wednesday night at the Arondequoit United Church of Christ is our board meeting. Um, if you're interested in seeing how the uh, club works, you're more than welcome to come. Uh, it's open to the public. Um, and then we um, uh, typically go out to eat afterwards. So some people come to the meeting just so they can go out to eat. Uh, as we are now getting into the uh, weather um, advisory potential, um, um, if East High School spe is specifically is closed or the city school district is closed, the meeting will be canceled. Uh, we'll try to get a post on the website. Um, sometimes if a storm comes in, they will cancel after school activities, which uh, we are considered. Um, so that would, uh, that would be listed there. Um, and uh, uh, take a look at uh, Channel 10 or Channel 13. Uh, they usually post all the school closings for, um, uh, for that possibility. Uh, coming up next month, we're going to be having Adam Engst um, from uh, Tidbits, and um, he's going to be talking about some of the new hardware, some of the new uh, uh, software. We, uh, we're kind of hoping the new Mac Pro will get uh, released by then, so um, uh, he might be talking about that. And also remember, as uh, the holiday season is coming um, up upon us, um, if you use the Amazon Smile link at uh, the uh, website, which I'll show in a minute, um, a, uh, a, a small portion of your purchase goes uh, toward the charity of your choice, and we hope you'll uh, um, uh, choose us. And uh, it doesn't raise your price any. Uh, Amazon just uh, takes a little bit out of their margin uh, to pay for that. And uh, that brings up our shopping um, uh, question here on our the right-hand side of our website. Uh, we have our shopping discount, one of which is the Amazon link. 
Um, so there's actually two pieces of the Amazon link. One is a referral code and the other is the charity donation. Uh, so if you haven't set up a registered charity on your Amazon account, the first time you go there, it will ask you uh, to do that. And if you uh, click on the uh, nonprofit link, um, it will take you to our charity code to get, uh, to get us set up. Uh, we also have a Cafe Press store if you want to get things with the Apple Cider uh, logo on it. Um, uh, users group, Mac, the Mac Users Group Center has some uh, offers. Lynda.com has, has some offers for free training. Uh, and the Take Control book series from um, um, formerly from Tidbits Publishing. Uh, Adam uh, and uh, Tanya sold, uh, sold that recently. Uh, they have a uh, catalog available, including a free uh, Read Me First on how to take control of uh, taking control. So we all need to have more control of our computers. Alrighty, so let's uh, jump into some of the news. Um, big news today from Apple. The uh, anxiously awaited 16-inch MacBook Pro was announced via press release. Um, we were expecting more of a, of a um, fanfare with uh, inviting press to the Steve Jobs Theater and, uh, or even maybe someplace in New York. Um, Apple's got uh, a smaller room in New York they could uh, uh, meet, meet at. Uh, but no, that was just a press release. And so basically it's the 15-inch computer, uh, MacBook Pro, um, in a larger 16-inch screen. So what they've done is reduce the size of the bezels. You may notice on the side here, uh, on the left and right, um, the bezels are a lot smaller, so they can get 16 inches of uh, more screen. What's kind of interesting is, is the 15-inch model is actually 15.4, but we never said that point four, it was just 15. So it went from 15.4 to 15.10. So, <laughs> so it only went up just over half an inch. <laughs> so it's 16 now. So it's not, you know, it's not a whole inch. It's, uh, it's uh, um, six tenths of an inch. Yeah, so now it's a 16 inch model. Um, in the old 15 inch model, when you, did, when you went into the tech specs, it did say 15.4 inches. Uh, but n everyone just said 15 inch. Uh, so uh, one of the things, let's go into the learn more, um, is it is the biggest and brightest screen they've had. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the other stuff in a minute. 16-inch uh, retina display. It's actually a 3K display. Um, so it's, uh, it's better than the 2K but less than 4K. So it's, so it's 3,000 pixels across. You can get up to 8 terabytes of storage uh, drive uh, in the computer. Um, and they're really targeting this at video and audio professionals. So you can have basically a mobile video workstation to have eight terabytes of uh, storage. Uh, super fast uh, uh, Radeon graphics, uh, either four gigs or eight gigs of graphics memory. So eight gigs of graphics memory is, is more than er earlier computers had of com total memory. Um, an eight core processor, uh, either an i7 or an i9. 64 gigs of RAM, so you can uh, you can really have a powerhouse with 64 gigs of RAM and an eight terabyte storage, and a six speaker surround sound um, audio system that's Dolby Atmos certified. So again, if you're doing movie production, you'll be able to do really really um, uh, immense um, uh, movie scores and be able to hear it really well, uh, and it has studio quality mics built in, so you can do. Um, ambient recording with a mic rather than having a, a, a whole microphone. Although I kind of expect a real microphone is going to sound a little better. Um, we use cheap $20 vocal mics because it's just for voice. Uh, at the radio station, we have um, four or $500 studio mics, even though that's mostly voice. Um, you, can, you can spend thousands of dollars on a high-end studio mic, just the mic itself, um, and to get the quality you, uh, you would want. Um, they've got a lot of, uh, we'll show the, the, the movie in a little bit, uh, but they've got a lot of uh, testimonials. They have uh, basically seeded this computer to several people. We had a nature photographer. Um, it's a, a P3 wide color gamut, so it's very bright, vivid colors, very, uh, very high quality screen, uh, up to 500 nits of brightness. So we had to, we had to go look up what a nit was. Um, and a nit is based on a candela. And a candela is based on one candle per square meter. Literally a candle, because that's how we used to get light. So 
basically 500 candles per square meter. So if you can f you think of a, a three-foot square and put 500 candles in it, that's how bright the screen will be. Uh, so that does mean when you're working outside in full daylight, the screen can be very bright, uh, and you can lower the screen brightness um, um, quite a bit and still be able to see it very well. Uh, we had a uh, songwriter. Uh, sh so here's Apple's Logic with uh, lots and lots and lots of tracks. Uh, up to an i9 processor, uh, bigger cooling mechanism for really uh, pushing the airflow through because of the uh, um, heat generated by the new processors. Interestingly enough, though, this doesn't look much different than current um, models. Well, you know, this morning's model, because now this afternoon there's newer models. Um, and Larger heat sink with bigger airflow, so everything keeps um, uh, uh, more and more uh, cooler. In fact, you may notice I have a cooling pad under my computer uh, because it gets kind of warm, pretty warm, uh, doing everything we're doing here with the video and audio streaming. Um, twice as fast as the previous MacBook, uh, running um, uh, different programs. Graphics are amazing. We've got a, a, an industrial light and magic person um, apparently doing uh, Iron Man. Well, Iron Man and Falcon. So that's one of the, uh, that's the um, Civil War movie, I think it is. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, up to eight gigabytes of uh, uh, video memory. Um, running your Unity editor, which is done for video games, you can do, uh, uh, it's up to twice as fast. Uh, let's see, the keyboard was a big thing. Uh, so they had another video game developer talk about the keyboard. A lot of people have been critical of Apple's butterfly keyboard. Um, being very loud and having problems with dust and dirt getting under the keyboard and then not coming out, so then your key quits working. Uh, and so after over three generations of keyboards, um, they started putting a, 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 a silicon um, um, uh, a rubber around the key to help stop stuff from getting down in there, um, but it still did. So if anyone has from the 12 inch MacBook in 2015, and then the MacBook Pros that all have the butterfly keyboard. If you have uh, keys that aren't working, either they don't work at all or they do double or triple um, uh, um, key entry, Apple has a repair program that will replace the keyboard for free up to four years from date of purchase. Um, and so um, nice peace of mind that if anything goes wrong with your keyboard, uh, they'll replace it. Um, what Apple has done now is they've re-engineered the old scissor switch and um, it has one millimeter of travel. So one of the big complaints about the butterfly keyboard is there's not much travel going up and down. And a lot of, a lot of the, the issues that I've seen and, and read about are old time typists. I started typing on a manual typewriter, so I had to really pound those keys. And so when I'm typing along, I really pound those keys, even though I don't have to, but for 40 years I did, so it's, it's hard, to, hard to stop doing that. And, and there's not much travel on the keys. Like in the, you know, the old mechanical typewriters, that key would go up and down an inch or more. Um, and so now it, it goes about a millimeter. Um, a better touch, uh, touch, more responsive touch bar. And a physical escape key is back. A lot of programmers apparently wanted that physical escape key, which is used a lot in, uh, in different programming. Um, so now th you've got the escape key on the left, um, and you've got the... Um, Touch ID on the right, so it has the touch sensor in for the for the fingerprint reader, and then the uh, regular um, uh, uh, giant trackpad, really huge multi-touch uh, trackpad available. Um, so it's it's kind of now with the uh, the touch bar is bracketed by that physical escape key and the physical um, 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 fingerprint reader uh, power button. So Face ID was a a rumor. Um, and the, the, the big thing we think is that there's not enough space to put in all the sensors because the screen is too thin and the bezel's too small. Um, when you look at how thin the screen is on, on the computer screen versus the iPad that has Face ID, the usual, uh, uh, the, the guess, because Apple hasn't said for sure, the guess is that it's just physically not big enough. So some people were saying, well, I wouldn't mind a, a bump sticking out the back a little bit like the phones have. Well, so it's about this big, so it's about this big. Right, but it's, it's about twice as big or three times as, um, um, as big as the screen. 
So one of, there's a, a, a PC laptop that put the camera on the keyboard where there's more room. And um, now whenever you're doing a voice chat or, or video, a video chat on that model, the camera's looking up your nose. At least when the, the, the camera's on top of the screen, it's sort of looking at your face. <laughs> Uh, in fact, I have to make sure I keep my screen pointing at me c for the for the video. Um, and that's uh, okay. Sorry, sorry to YouTube. I was in the wrong window. I got to go to this window, and now on that window, it will be on YouTube. Come on. Uh, all right. So we went through that. We went through that. Went through the video, the keyboard. So they're saying the keyboard is is uh, is a whole lot better than it used to be. Um, the six speaker sound, uh, again, Dolby Atmos, uh, up to eight terabytes of storage. Um, so here's Adobe Bridge, so you have huge screen space. So a lot of people used to like the screen space of the 17 inch, but they didn't like the weight of the 17 inch. And so now we've got more screen space in the 16 inch than the 17 inch used to have. Even in, in the old 15 inch, it had more screen space. Uh, so uh, people that want that huge um, uh, screen have the, uh, have the ability. And they've also increased the battery. They now have a 100 watt hour lithium polymer battery that will last up to eight, um, uh, I'm sorry, 11 hours of wireless web and video playback. Uh, see footnote 21. Um, so if you're just watching video and surfing the web, it will last up to 11 hours. And 100 watt hours is an interesting um, uh, limit. That's the limit of what the FAA will allow on an airplane. So if you have a battery more than 100 watt hours, you can't take it on an airplane. So they'll be still be able to take the uh, computer on an airplane. Um, and um, on the inside of the computer, in fact, that's one of the, uh, the pictures up here too. The inside of the computer, uh, you can see how big the battery is. So this, this whole bottom half of it is battery. Um, and it's uh, just mostly battery on the inside. Uh, let's see, the T2 security chip controls the uh, fingerprint reader, the secure enclave, uh, so it can do uh, uh, Apple, uh, Apple Pay payment methods with your fingerprint. Um, it helps to secure the boot process and to encrypt your storage. So if someone physically gets your computer, they can't um, mount your drive to access your data because it's all encrypted under the T2 chip. We, we, in the service department, we find problems that part of the new security is you can't boot an external drive because that's what the bad guys will do. They'll bo boot an external drive to access your stuff once they physically have your computer. So you have to manually go in and turn that feature on to, to reduce the security to allow someone in, in to boot externally. Um, so that's a little annoying in the service department, but it does add more security for, uh, for end users. Uh, the new th uh, th uh, same Thunderbolt 3, uh, up to 40 gigabits uh, uh, per second. Um, monitors, it will support two 6K monitors. And just coincidentally, Apple is releasing a 6K monitor, uh, the uh, Pro XDR machine. And so with that Thunderbolt speed and the graphics processor it has, you can do um, 6K monitors. Um, I think you can do four 4K monitors or two 6K monitors. So for as a production studio on the road, you've got this giant 16-inch laptop, and then you get back to your, your studio in the office, plug in your two giant monitors, um, and then uh, you can really, uh, really go. They have a neat thing where um, you can bring up AR on your phone, and it will show you the, what the laptop would look like sitting on your desk. The, they've got the same thing for the Mac Pro, so you can see the Mac Pro sitting on the floor next to your desk. Um, comes built in with Catalina. So this is the first uh, uh, computer now that has Catalina pre-installed um, when it comes. Uh, and uh, Annoyingly, you know, you can get $2,500 back when you trade up. So if you bought a new machine yesterday for $3,000, you'll get $2,500 back to trade up. Uh, but what's, what's really interesting I, and what I always like doing is maxing things out. Uh, but one of the things that we were surprised at is, is a lot of the rumors said the 16 inch was gonna be on top of the 15 inch and they'd keep the 15 inch, which starts at 23.99 and the 16 inch would probably start at three grand. What they did is they re replaced the 15 inch 
And so now the 16-inch starts at $23.99. But the one of the things they did is now it starts with 512 storage. So the 15-inch used to start with, with 256. So in essence, they've lowered the price of the new 16-inch computer. Uh, and then for $27.99, uh, you get the one terabyte SSD uh, and you get the i9 processor versus the i7. Um, so you get a really souped up computer with, uh, with the stock configuration. But what I always like doing is maxing everything out. So let's go in here. And it comes with a 2.3 gigahertz i9, which will turbo boost to 4.8. But let's go to 5.0 gigahertz. 64 gigs of RAM is only $800 more. Now the RAM and the storage cannot be added to later or, or upgraded later. So you have to buy what you think you're going to need. So let's just get the 64 gigs of storage. Um, let's get the 8 gig video card. It's only 100 bucks. <laughs> the 8 terabyte storage is $2,200, which is almost more than the whole computer. So now we're at $6,100 for a maxed out model, which is about $1,000 cheaper than it used to be for a significantly more um, computer. So the, the sort of the joke is when you're doing a $100 million Hollywood movie, uh, you know, six grand for a mobile workstation is nothing. Even even the new Mac Pro, the rumors are it's going to push fifty thousand dollars if you max it out. That's nothing for a hundred million dollar movie. I'll take ten, and then my movie gets done faster. <laughs> um, and let's see. I think did they say it's available today? No, next week. Uh, uh, next week, if you want to pay more, thir no Friday, if you want to if you want to pay for faster delivery or next week for free delivery. So how many people want to rush out and get one? <laughs> how many people want to rush out and get How many people are going to rush out and get one? <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, yeah, two, di two different questions, yep. Want versus need. Um, so... So the 13-inch is still the previous generation 13-inch. That didn't change at all. Let me see. Let's go up to Mac here. Uh, just the 16-inch is new. The 13-inch didn't change. Uh, when you went into buy. Yeah, you can choose whether you want the 13 inch. Right. Yeah, these are the new 16 inch models. Yeah, and the 13 inch models didn't change any. But one thing they did in the previous upgrade, the 13 inch models are now quad core when they used to be dual core. Um, and so they made the 13 inches a whole lot faster, and now the, the 15 and now 16 inch um, start at 6 core or 8 core. So the 15 inches are even faster. Um, when the club bought this 15 inch, we decided to get the 15 inch for the quad core processor um, um, uh, because the dual core would just be too slow for everything we do with it. Um, now a 13 inch dual core for a pound lighter might be, might be a good deal. But even though you so even then you you take the 13 inch, and we need the faster one with the more storage. So if we uh, if we go to the i7 which we have, the 16 which we have, the terabyte storage which we have, it's 27. So that's about a hundred dollars cheaper than the 16 inch, with a faster processor and a bigger screen. So do you take that $100 and get a little bit better, or do you save the $100 and get a little bit lighter? So it's, uh, it's all a matter of uh, what your wallet will do when you, uh, when you whip out your Apple Pay card. So now Apple Pay, you get 3% when you um, buy in the Apple Store. And the, someone um, um, t was talking about for iPhone, we were looking at this on Soundbytes um, a while ago. When you buy an iPhone on your Apple card, you get 3% back. 
but they have a monthly payment plan. They don't charge any interest on their monthly payments. So if, you know, 699 divided by 24 is, you know, 20, 20, 29, 12. Um, so if you buy a phone on the payment plan, put it on your Apple card, it's negative 3% interest rate that you pay. So in essence, they pay you to buy the phone because <laughs> you don't have to pay an interest rate. Because we were looking at then at the Google Pixel, and they're charging um, uh, $100 interest over the two-year period, which isn't bad, but $100 interest. So you can get negative 3% interest when you buy something on, uh, on the Apple Pay card. So that, and that's something to keep in mind with the Apple Pay card. Um, they are adding more um, services that give you the 3% cash back. And I want to learn more. Um, I think it was Uber and who else? They just added a couple. Yeah, it used the 3% used to be only Apple. Um, and now... Yeah, so Uber, T-Mobile, uh, Walgreens, uh, Dwayne Reed. So more companies are coming out with 3% because there was a lot of almost criticism of the Apple card giving you only 3%. I've got a Discover card that gives you 5% on certain, certain uh, retailers. Everything else is 1%. So what's interesting is, is for uh, the Christmas quarter, uh, uh, Amazon, Target, and um, Walmart are your 5% back, which is where you're going to be buying all your Christmas stuff. <laughs> so that's the, uh, that's the Apple 16-inch uh, MacBook. So if you have an older model computer, you might be interested in, uh, in upgrading, um, especially if you do video production, audio production, more professional work. Um, this is really a pro computer. There's been a lot of criticism about what pro means anymore, but this is, is pro. George? Yeah. So yeah. Yep. So the question is about Apple Care. Um, in general, a lot of people will recommend don't getting the extended warranty on your stuff because it usually doesn't pay for itself. With Apple products, it usually does pay for itself. Um, Apple Care Plus now covers accidental damage. So previous Apple Care didn't. So it just extended your warranty two years to make it three years total. Right, so now Apple Care Plus will give you two incident fees. So say you drop your phone and break the glass, that's not covered by Apple Care, so you'd end up paying $100, $150. Um, and and on, on the like the 10s Max, it was, I think, close to $300 to replace the glass. With Apple Care Plus, um, it's $29. And so you get two, two incidents in your two-year time period, which is a really uh, pretty good deal. W one of the things we often see, um, especially with Verizon, is they want to sell you the carrier insurance, which is 10 bucks a month. That doesn't sound bad. That's 120 a year. But then when you have an incident, it's $179 service fee. So Verizon's um, uh, Assurion insurance is significantly more expensive than Apple's. And their service fees are significantly more expensive than Apple's. So don't get Verizon. Uh, get the Apple Care. Um, Apple will give you 60 days to purchase Apple Care uh, from your original data purchase um, because they really don't want you to break the phone and then go buy the Apple Care. And um, generally speaking, it also uh, uh, adds um, your 90 day of phone support, gets extended to three years with computers and two years with mobile devices. Um, and it, it can be covered for everything. <laughs> the Apple TV and, and the, the HomePod, eh, we usually don't recommend Apple Care because they're so inexpensive as it is. Um, but having that, that break protection, and even with um, uh, like an iMac, the iMac Apple Care is $169, so it's relatively inexpensive. And we have seen people, you sort of say with a laptop, with a phone, you're carrying it around, there's more chance of dropping it and breaking it. 
with a desktop, it just sits on your desk. But how many, we've seen a lot of people will bump their desk, knock something over, they're reaching for something else, their computer tips over. Even if it doesn't fall to the floor, it can tip over on the desk, break the glass. And the way the iMac, the glass, and the LCD and everything is, is glued together, it's about an $800 repair. So the $169 for AppleCare on an iMac is, uh, is pretty, uh, um, pretty well worth it. Well, yeah, well, and, and it's different for each model computer. So the 13 in, the 12 and 13 inch Air um, is 269. The 15 inch is um, 349. So the bigger your screen, I, I'll get to the phone in a second. The bigger your screen, the, the more the Apple Care is because it would, it would cost more to, um, uh, to replace. Um, the iPad is um, um, $99. And the service fee is $49. So iPad Apple Care is really cost effective, especially if um, um, uh, you think you might drop it, which a lot of people do. Um, where it gets a little trickier is with the phone um, because the small phones have one price, the big phones have a, have a different price. And now they also include another tier, which is Apple Care Plus with theft and loss protection. So normally, if you lose your phone, you go on to find my phone and find it. If it's stolen, you might be able to f track it down, but you may not be able to get it back, especially if it's taken out of the, out of the town or, or held up in police evidence for who knows how long. So you can get that theft and loss protection. Generally speaking, if you travel a lot, we would recommend the theft and loss because you don't necessarily can find it in your own, in your own city. You know, you left it at the Applebee's the other day, and so you, you go back there and get it. I left my phone at, uh, at Wegmans um, uh, one night, and um, I tried to use the Find My iPhone, and it said offline, but it told me it was last seen at, at the Wegmans. So mm -hmm. when I went back to Wegmans to get it, they have so many lost phones, the first thing they do is turn them off. Otherwise, they would all be buzzing and pinging and dinging and ringing every minute, and it would drive everyone nuts. Um so the um, screen damage is one uh, price, and accidental, you know, anything else damage is some is everything else. So for theft or loss, the iPhone 7 and, and 8 is 199. Uh, the smaller of the newer phones is 229. The biggest of the newer phones is 269. So that's significantly less. You know, the iPhone 10s Max um, uh, could be 1,500 dollars if you max it out. If it's uh, if you lose it or it gets stolen, 269, you get another one. So. We, we, we generally like the regular Apple Care Plus. Adding the theft is a, li is a little more of a decision. Um, but if you tend to travel a lot, we feel it's, it's worth it because there's more chance of losing it somewhere not home. Yeah, after two years, it didn't used to be. Um, that was it. That was the end of the Apple Care. You couldn't renew it. Um, but we are hearing from people. I haven't seen it anywhere listed that you can keep your Apple Care going. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't found that screen anywhere. Um, right. Yep. When you buy a phone, um, you can add the Apple Care purchase into your monthly payment plan so it's it's like um uh 10 you know less than ten dollars a month to add apple care to your phone so with the you know the phone plan the, f the phones themselves are say 30 40 dollars a month um the phone plans and we're now seeing are the 40 50 dollars a month or more so add it all together you're probably paying a hundred dollars a phone um but when you pay off your phone your price goes down in the olden days of those two-year contracts, the two years was how long it took you to pay off your phone. At the end of two years, you were supposed to get a new phone. A lot of people didn't because their phone was fine. They didn't want to go through the hassle. But they still kept paying off the phone they've already paid off. <laughs> so the, the uh, carriers liked that too because they got more money because you kept paying them for something you already owned. Well, in, in the... 
Well, in, in the olden days of contracts, so, so yeah, so right now we're not doing a contract, we're doing a payment plan. It's, it's a nebulous legal distinction. So when you had a two-year contract for, say, $100 a month, half of that was the phone and half of that was the service. At the end of two years, you've paid off your phone and your price should go down because now you're only paying for service. They never lower the price. They kept charging 100 bucks a month, so now you're paying for a phone you've already paid for. It's like, it's like you finish paying your car payment, but you, you keep paying them anyway because you, you still have the car. Um, but so that only, that only was an issue with the contracts, which most companies stopped doing three or four years ago, so I, it, there's probably not anyone in a contract anymore. You're just on a payment plan. Installment payment, yeah, installment plan, yeah. Yeah, a lot of the, the carriers are now doing free phones. Yep. So if you want the, you know, the iPhone 11, you know, super whiz-bang phone, let's uh, bring that up here. Um, if I'm not trading in my phone, it's only 30 bucks a month. Well, that sounds good. Well, then you get to the part where you have to put your plan on there, and then, then your plan is probably forty, fifty, sixty dollars a month, depending on your carrier. It's one of the things we like: the smaller carriers. Um, uh, T-Mobile, um, I think we're paying forty dollars a line, um, including the cost of the phone. So, if you're with uh, with AT and T or Verizon, you may want to look at some of the other carriers, because the smaller carriers have to compete more on price. They're often a lot cheaper than the big carriers that have just been around forever. Alrighty, so that was the new phone. We talked about the watch. The other big thing now, Apple TV Plus is, is now available. Uh, started November 1st. Has anyone subscribed? Bob, yeah. Um, yep, if you buy any Apple device, uh, after September 10th, you get a free year of Apple TV+. Plus. Normally, it's $4.99 a month, and you get a seven-day free trial if you want. Um, there was a lot of people that were, were worried that Apple would... Um, what's the word I want? They would put too much control and make, make things too family-friendly. Uh, but then the pilot for C came out, which is, is a science fiction... Um, a hero story. Jason Momoa has to save the children, um, and and it's it's very Game of Thrones with a lot of sex and violence in the first couple episodes. Uh, so Apple is not um, handing down you know PG only uh, um, stories. The one issue I really want to see for all mankind an al alternative history where um, uh, Soviet Union got to the moon first and continued on, and so now we're the 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 back plot of the story of the story is that we're trying to send the first woman to the moon. And so we're recruiting female astronauts in the late 60s instead of waiting until the 80s with shuttle. The big issue with Apple TV Plus is they don't have a back catalog. They've got a dozen shows on now. Um, I think Oprah and, uh, and Servant, yeah, coming n November 28th. They're not out now, so they're coming later. Um, but they don't have a big back catalog of stuff to watch after you've watched the new episode of The New Thing coming out. Um, which is one of the reasons we think it's only four ninety nine. It's the cheapest uh, of the streaming services, um, and they're getting big names. Um, uh, the morning show is Jennifer Aniston, Reese Witherspoon, and Steve Carell. Uh, C is Jason Momoa. Um, they've got uh, Oprah. Uh, For all mankind is uh, uh, Brandon Braga, who did uh, a bunch of the Star Treks and um, 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 Battlestar Galactica. So there's big name people are doing these. Um, and so it's it's heating up more streaming wars again, and what that's also we're seeing now is Disney Plus. Um, Disney Plus uh, opened uh, yesterday, I think it was, and um, immediately crashed. <laughs> uh, Disney announced 10 million people have subscribed, uh, and so everyone was trying to download everything at once, and so they were had a lot of problems yesterday morning. Uh, Disney is six ninety nine a month, and they do have new shows in the Marvel Universe, in the Star Wars Universe, but then they also have this huge back catalog of all the Disney movies, the Pixar movies, the st Marvel, Star Wars, they own everything, basically, <laughs> and so they have this huge back catalog, so six bucks a month to get all the new stuff and all the, their old stuff is a pretty good deal, uh, and th they have a $69 a year plan, 
So if you if you pay for a year, you get two months free. And then they're th for twelve ninety nine, they're throwing in Hulu and ESPN. Uh, now, me personally, I don't watch much sports, so ESPN Plus isn't isn't much. But six you know six bucks a month to get Hulu, that's less than what Hulu costs to get all the stuff that Hulu has on it now. And so we're we're moving into a new era of of streaming wars, where companies are pulling back their shows and creating their own streaming service. HBO Max is uh, probably the next big one to come out with HBO's back content. Um, and we're, we're seeing this fight among content providers. In fact, even Disney um, has taken stuff off of Netflix to put on the Disney service. When they bought Marvel, uh, Netflix was running so, uh, some of the secondary Marvel characters. Uh, was it Luke Cage and Jessica Jones and Daredevil? And they, they're, they're pulling them off of Netflix as soon as those contracts expire to put them on Disney+. Plus. So we, for years, have been wanting a la carte television. So you buy the channels you want. Well, now we pretty much have it. We can buy channels from a dozen different services. You can get regular TV channels. Don't have to come from, from Spectrum. Uh, there's YouTube TV and Hulu TV and Sling TV and Amazon channels and all these companies selling TV channels plus all the extra services and extra shows that are on other channels, you may end up paying more for your television content than you, than you are now. So even now with, with cable, t I've got cable TV. I haven't, I haven't pulled the trigger yet myself, but I want Netflix for those shows. I want um, 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 Disney for those shows. In fact, I think Shirley's going to pay for Disney. Um, I do subscribe to Amazon Prime. Uh, because I like the, f the, sh the, the free shipping, but also they give me free books, free movies, uh, free uh, TV shows. So Amazon Prime is another pretty good deal because Amazon has so many other things. Um, that's uh, $120 a year is, 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 is a lot. T ten, bucks a <coughs> ten bucks a month doesn't sound like a lot until you say $120 a year. Yeah, if you shop with Amazon... Um, the bit, one of the big things with Prime used to be free two-day shipping. Well, now they have so many more distribution centers, and including uh, one is going to come online in Rochester. You're going to get free one-day shipping. And some stuff may even be free same-day shipping because it's already in the warehouse. In fact, someone um, on one of the shows I was watching said that Amazon has this, uh, one of their algorithms um, is for some of the, like the Amazon basic stuff. You buy paper towels. You buy a giant pack of paper towels once a month. So... They watch you do this, and then so like three days before you normally place the order, they ship one to your local warehouse. So when you place the order, it shows up next day, <laughs> or maybe even same day, um, because they can watch your spending habits, which is something people may not like, but that's the, what we give up for the convenience of these types of shopping things. Yeah. So there's a YouTube video of all of Disney's old stuff to get you primed to buy Disney Plus. I did I did hear there's a disclaimer on some of the Disney stuff about um, social, the social norms of the time may not reflect current attitudes, but that's the way they were back then. Yeah. So a lot of people are, are dumping one streaming service or the other to jump onto this other one. And, and we're not sure how Apple and Disney are going to do their series. So like Netflix is famous for, y there's a 20 episode series, they dump all 20 of them at once for you to binge. So you sign up for a month, watch all those shows, and then cancel it. And then, so then next month you sign up for Disney, watch all those shows and cancel it. Then the next month you sign up for HBO, watch those shows and cancel it. But we don't know um, how Apple and Disney now are going are gonna to do their series. Um, I think Apple is, is uh, dropping two or three episodes at once, and then once a week, once a week, once a week. 
because that's that's part of the, uh, also the whole um, uh, social commentary is, is you know the Game of Thrones was Sunday night, so Monday morning at the office everyone's talking about the episode, and and for several years now there've been all these cries, don't spoil it, it's on my DVR, I haven't got to it yet, so so we're moving uh, moving uh, toward uh, everyone watching everything on demand. You may not be able to discuss it because you aren't caught up to, to what the other people are watching. You know, Rick and Carol always ask me that. Have you seen the latest Flash? No, I'm too behind, so don't talk about it. <laughs> I hear Barry goes missing. <laughs> the crisis on infinite Earths. In fact, the Monitor just gave a date. What is it? Uh, December 8th is when the crisis happens because that's the day in real time that the episode airs. So they're, they, they break their own fourth wall. Um, so it's it's... TV is becoming an interesting thing. We'll have to have Phil in uh, in a couple of months to see how things are shaking out with uh, with uh, what's now being called the streaming wars. Barbara. So how do you compare the services? Um, every, pretty much every blog, every Consumer Reports, uh, CNET, um, Clark.com, never heard of them. There are a lot of different companies, Consumer Reports, Guide to Streaming Services, PC Magazine. A lot of places have Guide to Streaming Services. Um, and one of the things to keep watching on this, so this one came out November 12th, 2019. So this is really current. They may have Disney and Apple Plus on it. So a lot of the blogs will, will show the different channels. Fa in fact, channels you may not even heard of. Acorn. How many people have heard of Acorn TV? They show a lot of British television shows. So for stuff that the BBC shows that you can't get in America, uh, you can get Acorn for five bucks a month. Yep, Doctor Who. Now, I don't know, does Acorn show Doctor Who? Because BBC America has the new Doctor Whos, and PBS is still showing the old Doctor Who. So that's the on the other side of this equation, the content producers, which have traditionally had, had, had licensing deals with cable TV, are now having to change what they're doing because there's more places you can sell your content. So it used to be there was an exclusive license to the cable company because there was only the cable company. Now there's not. So quite frequently, uh, these companies will um, have comparisons on the different services. CBS All Access, we didn't even mention them. So CBS is doing their own show, their own streaming service with their own shows, and they have internet-only shows. So Star Trek is their big internet-only show. And uh, I don't know if they're generating enough revenue to keep that going because they're trying to suck in all of the Star Trek fans to have Internet only. But they also have uh, football for next few years. So you can watch football on the Internet and not, um, uh, uh, not, have, to <laughs> not have to sit in, your, in front of your giant television. You can sit in front of your little, little computer screen. Although now any computer screen is, is also a TV. Um, so you might have a bigger monitor in your office can now be a second third TV in the in the in the nice summer months you can have your computer or your iPad out on the porch um, oh enjoying the summer air with the drink of your choice while you're watching your <coughs> excuse me watching your shows so so sort of the bottom line is how do you compare streaming services uh, you do a lot of reading um, and it changes frequently Right, so a lot of streaming services will have two prices. Uh, one is ad-free or sometimes ad uh, fewer ads, and one is full ads. Uh, it's che cheaper, so usually cheaper for full ads. I think Hulu, uh, Hulu does that. Um, if you, yeah, so as low as $5.99 a month if you want ads. And can I find a pricing link without saying start my free trial? Um, there we go. Or eleven ninety nine a month for uh, fewer ads, and some shows have no ads, uh, so it's it's sort of catch twenty two. And so Hulu is also one that has a, has television channels uh, for forty five dollars a month. They have sixty of the most common TV channels, so that can be less than cable TV. So instead of going to Spectrum for getting TV channels, you can go to Hulu Live TV to get your TV channels. And Bob has done that. Which which are you still using Fubo? Uh, Different sports channels, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So ESPN has their own streaming service of their own stuff. So so that so ESPN, the channel ESPN is probably licensed to cable stations. Yeah. Yep, that's one of the other things. Some of these have have add-ons, so you can get HBO, Showtime, the, the traditional extra channels. S yep, some of the streaming services have DVR functions. Unless you pay more, you you so you might be able to save 50 hours of programming. If you pay more, you might be able to save 100 hours of programming. So It's a full-time job, yeah. And so one of the one of the things, uh, Phil Dampier from Stop the Cap, uh, we have him in uh, at least once a year. Uh, he put out this chart when he was here in May um, of the top hundred channels and what streaming service carries them and how much they cost. And um, he updates that uh, uh, frequently on his Stop the Cap website, where they keep track of uh, of stuff uh, in the uh, Stop the Cap. Um, Oops, I just quit the wrong program. There we are. Um, yeah. Stop, oops, stop the cap. Um, so he's promoting better broadband, fighting data caps. He actually started the company, what, 10, 15 years ago now when Frontier was going to put a 5 gigabyte per month cap on their data um, um, uh, television uh, service. Or not tell an internet service, um, <laughs> so now Frontier and he predicted when he was here in May that Frontier is going to be bankrupt uh, by the end of the year, and now it might be uh, early next year before they go bankrupt. They keep buying up local telephone companies um, as local telephone companies are are dying off because most people are moving to cell phone and not using landlines anymore. So Frontier got out of the cell phone business so they could get into the local phone line business. Um, I don't know if it's the link is directly on here. Um, let's see. He does um, streaming services. Let's search for streaming services, uh, and they um, they'll be in an article where he's done. It was in May. The last one he did was in May, so it may not be here. Ah, there we go. So here's what streaming services there are. Some of them. Um, I don't see a compare button though. So, okay, so th this is if you want articles on a certain topic. So so these are articles about Apple TV, um, not comparing the services themselves. I should send him a message asking him to, uh, if he makes that uh, article uh, um, um, available frequently. Uh, but I don't, know how f I don't know how fast he updates it. I know he updates it before he, he um, comes to our meeting. So yeah, so it's 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 a full time job trying to keep track of all your services. What we what we like to say to start with, have a notebook next to your computer and write down the networks you watch, not just the shows, but what network they're on. So you know, I need the Smithsonian Network, I need the History Network, I need FS1 Network, because that's how the services are are advertised. It's not I want to get Channel 8, 113, and 427. You need to know the, the name of the network you're on. In fact, that's why most TV shows now have the little network logo in the corner um, for that brand awareness. Most people don't know what networks any of their shows are on. They just know I want to watch NCIS on Channel 8 at 8 o'clock. And so NCIS, that's one of the franchises that are CBS only. So to watch NCIS online, you have to subscribe to CBS All Access. All righty. Um, Anyone have any burning questions or we'll take a break and then get into Marion. Ding.
I've been sitting here, and I got my uh, one of my movement rings filled. My stand goal has been filled while I'm sitting here. Yeah, Rick. So, question about Catalina um, and reformatting hard drives. Why is my my um, Hang on just a second. My Safari window's not uh, not broadcasting right. Sorry, right. there we are. Got to get that Safari window. So when you upgrade, and this actually started in High Sierra, um, there's a new file system called APFS. You don't have to worry too much about it. It's just a new way of doing things. Um, and when you have a solid state drive, can't type and talk at the same time anymore. I N A. Um, when you have a solid state drive, it would switch that solid state drive to um, the new file system. If you had a spinning drive, it didn't for internal drives. I don't know if they're doing that to external drives. I don't think so. Unless you install it on an external drive. And then it switches to APFS. So Mojave and Catalina, the boot drive is APFS. So if you install it on an external drive, it probably switches it to APFS. One of the other uh, problems we, we've run into, well, the big problem with Catalina is 32-bit programs are dead and won't work anymore. So make sure before you upgrade to Catalina. And Apple's getting sneaky. Jerks. Microsoft got into huge trouble for sneaking in Windows 10 upgrades. And now Apple is sneaking in a High Sierra, uh, or yeah, High Sierra Catalina upgrade without m making it clear that you're doing a system upgrade to a completely new system and not just loading the next update. So I have an update waiting, but I can I can upgrade, and so you're going to get notifications that you should upgrade to Catalina, and then you hit OK, and and your whole computer dies because nothing works because you've got old software. There is a warning that. Old programs are not optimized for Catalina, and people say, well, okay, I don't, I don't care. Uh, what that really means is they won't run under Catalina. So in Mojave, we're getting warnings that about old programs, and specifically it means 32-bit old programs, are not optimized and, and may not work on a future OS. Well, we're at that point now. 32-bit programs will not work, but the messages aren't clear enough. Um, so we've, <laughs> we've, we've sort of had a new business recently at our shop of downgrading people back to Mojave. Um, and if you have an external backup drive, um, it's a little easier to downgrade to Mojave. You still have you, you back up, erase your computer, install Mojave, and then restore from backup. So it's a long, tedious process, but it can be done. One of the things that Mojave... Pardon? They're, s they're sneaking in this Catalina upgrade without making it very clear that's what you're doing. The, yeah, this more info button are updates to the Mojave I'm currently running. So I'm going to install those probably tonight because I didn't want to have any, have any problems before the meeting. So those are other updates for Mojave, but they really highlight Catalina um, to, to get you to upgrade. And if all of your software is current, you know, not more than two or three years old, there's probably going to be no problem. But a lot of people have old versions of Microsoft Office, old versions of, of Adobe Creative Suite, uh, QuickIn, QuickBooks. Um, three of my audio editing programs I use uh, for the podcast um, are not compatible, and th they've been, they've been uh, uh, discontinued and abandoned. And so the warnings aren't clear enough about things that are going to stop working with Catalina. Uh, so downgrading is easier. Although we, one of the things Catalina does is change the structure of your boot drive. So we're used to having one hard drive icon for basically for your hard drive. Um, and I was, uh, I was looking external. Let me see if I can find that. Um, so we, we're used to having one hard drive icon. What Catalina does, and it, it's, it, it, they're doing it for good reasons, they're splitting your OS and your data into two volumes, 
but then showing it to you as a single volume so it looks exactly the way it used to and, and you don't know any different. But that does mean if the, the OS gets corrupted, your data is okay. And if your data gets corrupted, your OS is okay. And that's why it makes it easier to downgrade because you didn't used to be able to downgrade um, uh, an OS because the OS and your data were all mixed together. But now with Catalina, it's easier. If you back up to an external drive, if you back up to a network drive, you can't restore in Mojave because Catalina changes the structure of network backups for these uh, uh, two volumes. And so you have to go back to the Mojave backup. So make sure, sort of in general, make sure you have a backup before you do an upgrade. But people aren't realizing this is an upgrade because the messages aren't clear enough. And for all the flack that Microsoft got into, we're really surprised that Apple is doing this too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Clark, PC Magazine, Consumer Reports, CNET. So that one's from September 1st. Here's another one from, from CNET on September 23rd. Yeah. Yeah, oh, here's that top 100 charts compared. This may be where Phil is getting his. There's the chart. Oh, you can get a Google Sheet. And so how many services do they compare? A lot of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Yeah. And so sling, yeah, two from Sling. You've got Sling Orange, Sling Blue, different channel packages. You're probably going to want them both because there's always that one channel. Time Warner is doing that with me now. I'm, I'm on the silver plan, but I can't get um, Science Channel. I need to get the gold plan for Science Channel. But I have Discovery Channel, which is owned by Science. So stuff that's on Science eventually comes to Discovery. I just got to wait a little longer. It's a uh, it's a big uh, frustration these days. Um, yeah. So Rick, I'm I'm not entirely sure if it, what it does to external drives. I haven't had uh, had I haven't seen it because I have installed I have installed ooh I have installed Catalina on a volume on an external drive, and it left all the other volumes alone in a, a uh, HFS and it made an APFS container all by itself. So yeah, so I'm gonna say it leaves everything else alone and just puts Catalina in a APFS container when you install on an external drive. Mabel. So the, so, so the question is about staying in High Sierra. We are generally recommending that you stick with High Sierra 10.13. Unless your computer is a 2015, 2016 or so, basically uh, 8 gigs of RAM and a solid state drive. Mojave was really slow on older computers. That 8 gigs of RAM and a solid state drive really, really helps. Um, and so if you have that, Mojave's okay, but there are compatibility issues with, again, with older software, but not as bad as Catalina was. Um, but so check your older software. Uh, we've talked in the past about a website called Roaring Apps. R. Um, Roaring Apps, back when uh, the Apple code names were uh, roaring, large roaring cats, where you can put in a, a program. Um, so let's do photo, whoops, Photoshop, whoops, Photoshop. So I say I have, I have an old Photoshop CS5, um, and you can see what the reports are on compatibility with different OSs. And so, so, so Mojave is interesting. Uh, two thirds of the people say it works fine. A third of the people um, uh, say they've had problems. So it's a good place to go to check your third party software. A little easier than, than going to the website of every single company you have software from. Um, eventually we'll see Apple stop releasing updates. So right now, wh what they typically do is when they release they say a security update, 
it comes out for the current version and two versions old. So we are still seeing um, uh, updates for High Sierra. Uh, let me get to the apple.com slash support slash downloads, I think it is. So they're still releasing updates for High Sierra. Of course not. Um, but when the next version comes out, 10.16, they'll probably stop doing High Sierra updates. But by, by, so in another year, you may have to decide to upgrade to 10.14, or you may be ready for a new computer at that point. Um, but, but currently, High Sierra is still, uh, still uh, supported and working. Yep. All right, we're going to take a, 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 a 10, 15 minute break. Uh, we have some uh, refreshments over there. I know, Tr Shirley, you made a, a banana, uh, not uh, zucchini bread. What else? What else do we have? Brownies. Ooh, we'll be over there quick for brownies. Um, and uh, I can take uh, membership if uh, if you uh, need to check your expiration date. I can check that as well. Alrighty. And oh, when we get back, we're gonna have uh, Marion from uh, the Rochester Genealogical Society. And what was your last name? Jerry Pons. Is it Cash? It's about Cash right. Alrighty, thank you. Just, just that that keypad. How old is that article? No, I'm, I was trying to see. Because I know that used to be a feature. I don't know if it still is. So that article is probably too old. Yeah, that's a desktop keyboard. Yeah. That's a desktop keyboard. yeah. But many of the functions um, you can use with the arrow key. So option and arrow will do move a word at a time. Control and arrow will do a sentence at a time. So a lot of the functions that used to be on the separate keypad are, are part of the arrow keys with the option and the control. This is in... Uh, mm-hmm. There's probably a keyboard you can get to give you that numeric options. And this is in French, so I can't read it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, is that a little, um, is that the Moshi one? Yeah. With the two ports on it, yeah. Yeah, that's almost as, as many as I had, but I wanted HDMI and VGA, and I got Ethernet too, but it's physically bigger. It's, yeah, yeah, it just plugs right into the two ports there. That's pretty cool. 
Oh, this is the hyperdrive. Yeah, Moshi makes one of those, and uh, we've 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 got a couple of them in our shop. But yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I looked at it one day, and then when you look at all the reviews, and it's it's so simple. Print the print the pitch. You can really print the print. You just send it to us, or or you know anyone in Maine that can print this stuff. Yeah, they're they're yeah they're thund they're thunderbolt. Which embeds USB, okay. and then so this is Thunderbolt three. That's Thunderbolt two. Okay, so it's two Thunderbolt three connections, and that's a SD card. Uh, micro SD card. Micro SD, and then how and many USBs? SD. Because there's so many out there, right? How many of the three little two or three little ones? Yeah. Official Doctor Who channel on YouTube. Well, the speeds are out there, so we're on uh, thirty twelve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's coming through. Yeah, sure. I'll decide it's coming through.
Family Guy porn jokes the other day. <laughs> Came up in my Family Guy feed. That's one of the features a lot of the new TVs have. They'll have somebody's service built into the TV, sometimes more than one. So usually the, you get like an Apple TV set-top box and it works better for watching Netflix and Hulu and Disney than it is to, yeah, to use the service built into the television. But it's a catch-22 there. All right, Marion, do you want to get set up? these lights off. Hey Rick, do you remember what switches you threw back there last month? Did you turn these lights off up here? <laughs> do you want to sit or stand? It's easiest that way. It may cost more, but it's easiest. In fact, it's, it's getting hard now when you want to watch one show and you got to switch to here. Oh, yeah, that's that's one, Rick. You're close. Yes, tell him to stop. <laughs> Thank you. But that one, yeah, that one he just turned off turned back on. He kept going after you told him to stop. He's in the back. All right. Well, you kept going after she said stop. Turn that last one back on <laughs> to get the, the lights back there. camera off and then this we turn on and there we are so now we've got your camera your computer on the feed so let's make it a little bigger for you that's better now you can read that easier
much time I'm going to turn off in a minute. All righty. You ready? Okay. All righty. Let's uh, get started back again. Just need to get the microphone in front of your mouth. All right, so we've got her feed in there. All right, so we will bring in Marion Henry from the Rochester Genealogical Society. And I'm going to bring this window up. All righty. And Take it away. <laughs> um, you've got an hour. You can fill as much as you want. Hi, my name is Marion. If you have any questions during this, you're going to have to raise your hand and get my attention, but you can do that at any time. If you want to tell me your life story, that's not a question. But if you have a question about something about this program, that's a question. So what I'm going, oh, this is going to be interesting. All right. What I'm going to talk about is this program called Reunion. And it's a software program that's only available for Mac. And it's the only genealogical software program that I have ever used because when I started doing genealogy with a computer, I only had Mac computer. It was the only genealogy software available for Mac. Fortunately, it's a very good piece of software, and so I have continued with it. And so this is about um, Reunion version 12. It is the most recent version of the software. And what I have for you is um, essentially two parts for this talk. What I'm going to do first is to start with a blank spreadsheet. This is essentially, this program essentially builds up a database. And so I'm going to start with a blank sheet and show you how you would enter data if, in fact, you were to purchase this program and to start to do your own genealogy. And then after I've done that for a little while, we'll come back to this particular spreadsheet, which has a lot more information in it because there are some features that make more sense 
if you have more than just, say, a dozen people in your spreadsheet. So we'll start by getting a new family file. And mm -hmm. do you ever actually try to type while you've got the microphone in front of you? And you, how do you see the people? Uh huh. You, you know, my father told me you had to learn something new every day. I've saved it right for the very end. Yes. Okay. So I I'm. Had it in the typewriter. I had to bang the keyboard hard. <laughs> yes, I had that too. And so I've entered the name of this program, of this new family sheet, and um, then reunion wants to know how I'm going to proceed. And genealogy programs have what they call a GEDCOM file. This is sort of like a word processor having a, a generic kind of text file. So if you have a whole bunch of information from a different genealogy software, that software can produce a GEDCOM file, which you can then put into the reunion software, but we're not going to do that. We're going to start by adding a male person. So this is going to be the first person in the spreadsheet. And that's his first name. And this is his last name. OK. And we have a birth date for this person. So we're going to go up here. And we're going to put his birth date in. Okay, now, um, hmm. let me go back here. When I entered the birth date, I should have a source. If you're, unless you're doing 10th grade genealogy, whenever you have a piece of information, one datum, it should have at least one source. And so I'm going to show you how you would add a source. Down here, add a source. And this is going to be a new source, but you only have to enter a source once. Once you have entered the source, then you can use it in any other situation where you would pull information from that source. If you had, for example, um, a marriage license application, you would use that as the source for the name of the groom, the name of the bride, and the dates and all that sort of stuff. So you would use a source for many different pieces of information. So I'm going to add a new source. And you can see here a list of the different kinds of sources that Reunion expects you to use. Mine is going to be a book. And so I can now fill this out. Now, there's lots of different formats. The whole idea of having a source is that you have enough information so that someone else can find that source, not necessarily to check your work, but they might think that that source would have something useful for them, too. So you need to have enough information for somebody to go find it. problem with this is that the computer is at the wrong distance for me to see it. So things are a little fuzzy. Uh-huh. If I do that, I'll swallow your microphone. <laughs> All right. So there, I have entered the source. And it's down here. And it's source number one. And so whenever you want to use that source again, you don't have to type in everything all over again. It's already in the computer. You would just specify that that's the source. OK. Oh, 
Oh, that would just be um, personal communication. You mean that's the person who told you? Yes. Yes, yes, that would be personal communication. Yeah. So if if um, if my father told me when he married my mother, I would accept that as a source. I would also look for a marriage certificate. For any piece of information in my program, I would I would prefer to have at least two independent sources, just because you know he might have misremembered. How many men actually remember their wedding anniversaries? That sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. But yes, personal communication. Um, somebody's diary would be a good example of that. Yeah. Okay, now this thing that's called family view, that's what a genealogist would call a family group sheet. And so it has a space here for a husband and a wife, and up here would be the parents of the husband and here would be the parents of the wife. Now this is showing up right so you can see, okay. You're seeing what I'm seeing, good. And then um, the children would go down here. And so a person, a, s a given person could show up as um, one of the parents. He could show up as a child in a different family group and he could show up as a father in another family group, okay? So what, what I'm going to do now is to add the father of this person, and I simply click in this space where the father's information is going to go. And I get the sheet here, which looks very much like what we had before. And that's the father's first name, and the surname is assumed, there's a default value. He assumes, the program assumes that the father's surname is the same as the son's surname. You can override that, but you don't have to type it in because the program offers it to you as uh, the most likely thing to go in that spot. Okay, and up here in events, we'll put the birth date. And here I'll put a death date. Okay, now um, let's, in fact, let's go back there. The default here for events are birth, death, and burial, but you can um, add other events right here, add events. Here is a list of the things that the program says you could add. It's offered as part of the package of the program. And here where it says event preferences, you can customize this where you can add any of these things. You could say, okay, I want, say, citizenship. Add that event. Oh, I'm sorry, I clicked the wrong thing there. No, go back here, citizenship and then here, add it. So now it would be added to, to each one of the people in there. And if you decided, oh, you know, that was a stupid thing to do, then you can just take it out. And what I did here is to add an event. You can add your own category. So if you had some particular thing that happened to many of the people in your family and it's not on this list, you can name it, and you can put it into the program yourself. And I'm not gonna do that. <coughs> Marriage is separate. Marriage is a different thing. Yeah. I'll show you. Marriage goes right in here. It's, it's an entirely separate thing. The events have to do with a particular person, and the marriage is more than one person. That's why. 
Okay. So now we'll put spouse here, and all I have to do is click in the space where um, the spouse would be. And you see the surname here, the, the, the woman is always given her maiden name. And so there is no way that Reunion could guess what her maiden name is from the name of her husband. It's a, um, a generally a problem for genealogists is figuring out the maiden name of the wife. That's why your mother's maiden name is um, a security question sometimes, you know. Okay, so we now have the parents here, and we have one of the children, the person that we started with. So now we can add other children. I think I have a list. So you can add a male child, a female child. If you don't know the sex of the child, you say, well, how would you not know the sex of the child? Well, when I get back to my New England ancestors, they have hate evil as a first name, hate evil. Well, is hate evil a boy's name or a girl's name? Today, we don't name a child hate evil. It's a boy's name. <laughs> but, but I had to figure that out. The first time I came across it, the document that I was looking at did not tell me if this was a boy or a girl. It said the kid's name was Hate Evil and it was born on this particular date in 1500 and whatever. Yeah, so you might not know. So um, what I'm gonna do now is just add a few kids here so that you kind of see the routine that you go through. And I'm going to put the kids in in alphabetical order. So the first one that I've got is a little girl. And I'm putting the birth dates in for a reason. So now you see here we have two names in the children area. And the next one is a little boy. This thing here, done, I can click done or I can press enter. It, it gives me the same thing. All right, oops, sorry. Now the next one is also a male child. Named Hanson. And when I go to put in the birth date, reunion says, you might be making a mistake. This looks a little bit similar. This is error checking on the part of this software. Because I have typed in a name that looks a little bit like something that's already there. And so at this point, it just wants me to make sure that I'm not putting in a duplicate, a person that I've already got in the spreadsheet. And I say, yes, I know, I have Halfred and I have Hampson, and they are, in fact, two different people. So we're gonna continue to add a new person. And so now I can put in the birth date. And we'll now add another little girl. And you can see at each case, the child's surname is the surname of the father. That's the default value. Now here you see, all of a sudden, there's not enough room in the display area. Well, I've gone too far, so all you have to do is sort of raise the roof here a little bit. You can reformat that space so that you have room for more. Well, 16 inch screen is just not right. 
I have a little jelly in mine. I thought it was yeah. jelly. Yeah. Okay. So here we get the same kind of thing. Marigold looks a little bit like the previous name, May. And so the, the software just wants to make sure that I know what I'm doing here. And in fact, um, May is not the same as Marigold, and Marigold is a new person. done something wrong. Oh. I can't type. 1683 is, that was another error checking thing. It should have been 1383 and I managed to put in 1683 and the program said, I'm sorry, that's not reasonable. Okay. So now I have six kids, and we'll stop there. If I go here, where we were adding children, one of the um, possibilities on this list is to sort. And if I choose that, what it's going to do is to change the order of these kids from alphabetical to birth order, which is the more usual way a genealogist would look at this collection of kids. Okay. Now that only works if you know the birth, at least the birth year for all of the kids. But it's a handy thing to be able to do because you're going to put kids in as you find them. And you're going to have to possibly sort that list several times. Now, we're going back. This is the person that we put in to begin with, and he's now going to get married. There are 13 kids that belong in here. I'm not going to bother to add them. You can just imagine the 13 kids, okay? But we're going to go and put more of Rose Cotton's ancestry. So here is her dad. And you can see that the surname is assumed. a mom and as is usual there's not much information about mom we don't know when she was born or when she was died Tolkien did have a certain bias in this okay now we're going to put in some siblings because there are some interesting things that happen there So Rose has a brother. Nope. There. Are you beginning to get the idea that you, in fact, could do this? Because you just do the same thing over and over again. Yeah, but you're not getting all the information you need to get the job done. 
It is, and evaluating your sources so that you have some idea that the information you collect is actually accurate. Genealogists talk about primary sources and secondary sources. And I mean, the, the distinction is pretty obvious. But just because something is a primary source, a birth certificate, for example, it was issued contemporaneous, more or less, with the event. That doesn't mean that, that it's right. My, my maternal grandmother's death certificate has her name on it because the information was not given by somebody from the family. It was given by the funeral director who made stuff up. He had to fill in the blanks, and so he put in stuff that looked reasonable, and nobody bothered to look at it until his granddaughter came along and started doing genealogy and said, that's not right. My son's name is spelled wrong on his birth certificate. That was only 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. They still make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So there's you know what's accurate, and there's what's correct, and they're not always the same thing. And I've completely lost track of where I am. Okay. I was adding the last kid here. Okay, that's enough kids. Now, what we're going to do here is to go down to this guy because when he got married, he married this person called Marigold. And you can see that as I'm typing, the union suggests, just as many other software programs do, and so I can check. And when you have really long names, that comes in handy. OK. So now the union has recognized that I've put in a name for the spouse that it already has and wants to know, is this a different person or is this the same person? Something that a genealogist also would like to know. And I'm saying at this time, this is not a new person. This is, in fact, the person that you already know about. This one that you've already selected up here. And this wants this program wants to confirm because this is a really important point. And what we have now just done is to is to assure the program here that the daughter in this family is in fact the wife that belongs here. And that's um, a critical question in genealogical research. It's, it's very um, common to have a small town that has several people with the same name. And you have to demonstrate that somebody's daughter is somebody else's wife, and it's the same person. And just because they have the same name, that's not good enough. You have to have proof for that. So that's, um, it's good that the program is a little bit cautious about accepting this. Are you sure? Okay, now I want to go back. Oops. To Rose here. Things here. And I can assure you I'm going somewhere with this. And his father. Now, 
now we'll go over here because we're coming into a different family. The Cotton family is going to marry into the Greenham family. Did you do this for the book or did people do it from the book? This is this is from Tolkien's book. He he created this entire genealogy. Yeah. It was important to him. He surely read the Ring Trilogy, right? Yeah, okay. Now, um, while we're here, we haven't looked at this part here, facts. And the default here is that it talks about occupation and education and religion. But this works exactly the same way as the events thing does, that there's a lot of other things that you could put there. And just as the events function you can add any of these that are suggested, and you can make up your own to add to this list. So you can customize this part of the program to suit what you want. And at any time in the program when you see this question mark, that takes you to a help. So a help menu somewhere. There's lots of help embedded in the program. So although it's pretty intuitive how it works, if you get stuck, um, you can generally find the answer. Oh, I was also going to show you this too. This note section, this is for free form text. It holds about 10,000 words. And so you would use this for perhaps your transcription of uh, some kind of a, a um, a will or a, a deed of some kind or um, anything that where it's it's not um, a specified form. It's just some kind of notes that you would like to put down there. And it's big enough to hold a fair amount. Okay. So now. Where's his dad? Okay. All right. And there were a whole bunch of kids here, but I just want to add one more because it's a link to another family. And here again, it's a similar name. And so we're just making sure that we're not putting in a duplicate. Is this the same family that we added earlier? Yes. Or is this a new one? No, okay. it's, it's from what has been entered previously. Each person has it its own um, identifier. And when you start to type a name, it's searching through all of the names in the program. And when you put in something that's kind of close, um, just just in case you start you made a typo or something like that, it just wants to avoid putting in duplicates because it's a lot easier to prevent the mistake than it is to correct it later. Okay, so this just happens to be the eldest and the youngest of the children of this family here. And I put that in because over here,
and his father. His father spelled his name differently. So although the default is offered, you can change it by simply typing over it. It's that easy. Okay, now I'm going to deliberately put in, by mistake, the death date in the birth space. And it says, you know, when you do it that way, the son was born after the father was age 70. Do you, do you really want to do that? It's part of the error checking in the program. You would probably be surprised at how many times I have come across things where some person has compiled a genealogy and has no qualms whatsoever about having a kid born three years after the mother died. You know, this it just happens. It's so easy for these things to creep in. So it's really nice that this program kind of has my back here and will not let me do something this stupid. So it's possible. It's possible. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> it's simply improbable. And so it's just the program wants to know, really? Yeah. Yeah? You're sure about this? Okay. And, and if I had told it to ignore this warning, it would have accepted. So okay, that's what she said. But we're going to put in the right value now. Okay. Now I want to put this person up in the parents and put in a son for him. apparently done something wrong here because it's not doing what I wanted it to do. Let me see if I can find it. Okay, I can't find my mistake. Yes. Maybe I've spelled something wrong. No? Well, it happened the last time I gave this talk, too. Works just fine at home in my own little studio. Well, never mind. Yeah. No. By now we should be okay. But anyway, I think that gives you enough of an idea of how you would go about uh, um, entering data for any particular person. And so we'll just leave this one here for the moment. And we'll go to this program here, which is kind of a subset of um, my own genealogy. This is where I've got a
problem that I'm currently working on. And so it only has 133 people in it, but it's enough to get an idea of um, some of the other features of the program. So this sidebar on the right here can list a whole bunch of things. Right now it's listing people. And this is the names of all of the people who are in this database. And they're put in um, alphabetically. And you have uh, dates displayed, which helps to um, distinguish. Um, for example, down here, I have three different people named Abraham Henrik. And um, the dates help to sort them out. And it also has relationships here. These relationships are all um, with regard to the source person. And this, this is the source person right here. It says source. So one of these, Abraham Henrik, is his father. That's the guy up here. Right? Another one is his brother. And the third one is his half-nephew. So if I wanted to um, see the brothers of this guy, I want him to be in with the children of this couple. So here's Abraham, who is the brother of the source person, a second time. And that you can find out right here. This little thing up here, that's called the person button. And the fact that it's red tells me that there is a second marriage. But if I click on that, I can look for spouses and children. So for Abraham Henrik, the father, here is the first wife and the children of that marriage. And here's a second wife and the children of that marriage. He, um, well... She died young, and he took another wife. Okay, so now if the half-nephew has the same surname as the source person, then that half-nephew has to be a child of his half-brother because if it were a child of his half-sister, she got married, she would take her husband's name, the kid would take the husband's name, so... The Abraham that we're looking for as the half-nephew has to be a child of David. And there, and there he is. Okay, so um, here you can also have a list of sources. So here are all of the sources that are used in this collection of people. And they can be of different kinds, books, census records, church records, um, a free-form thing for something that doesn't follow any particular kind of format, tax lists, vital records, tax records, whatever. So if I highlight a particular source, then I can go down here. This is look like a hammer. That's tools. So I can filter and find out all of the people who have some information that came from that particular source. What did I use that source for? Now, this can be really useful if you're coming back to an area of your research that you've been away from for a while, and, and you have a particular source, and um, you can say, did I look at this source before? Yeah, what did I do with it? And these are the people that have that I got some information about these people using that source.
Now, um, one of the things here for sources is unused. And I deliberately put in a source here, which is not connected to anything at all, just so that there would be something to show up there. If you have an unused source, you have to wonder what it's doing there. You Apparently, you looked at this thing, and there was no information connected to any person in your family tree so far. Um, now, now, this is a, a dummy source. It's, it's not complete, and it isn't connected to anything, and it shouldn't be. But this would be a way, in fact, to put down a source that you thought might be useful. And in fact, it turned out there was nothing in there that was helpful. But if you don't note that down, you're going to keep going back to that same source because it's still going to look like it ought to be in interesting to you. So it's a good idea to note the negative results as well. And this is the place that Reunion gives for you to put a list of sources that you looked at that weren't any help at all. They might turn out to be helpful later when you get more information, but at this point, they were of no use whatsoever. You can also sift through your sources and say, show me anything that contains A lot of these folks were from Cumberland County in Pennsylvania. So here I can ask, how many sources have I looked at for Cumberland County? Just looking through this list, I might say, hmm, I should have looked at this other source, and I haven't yet, so at least I would know that much. Now, and if I pick something like that, pick that one there and say where did I use that I only used that source for this particular couple so if I go back and find that source again I will know not only that I used it because it's in the list but I will know what I used it for so now I if I want to go back and check it for other people that I perhaps have um, just discovered in my more recent research, I would then know that I, I haven't quite closed that loop yet, and I can go back and do that. OK, there's, there's more about sources, but that's good enough. to show you a little bit about the clipboard. If you put in a person and you make a mistake, you put it in the wrong family, or it turns out to be a former ancestor who's not actually related to you at all, you can eliminate that person by dragging them onto the clipboard. And once the person is on the clipboard, then you can decide whether to keep it or toss it or put it in a new place. But that's how you would um, correct an error. And here is a thing called islands. And um, the purpose of this in the software is to look for people who aren't connected to anybody. What is that person doing in your database? if they're not connected to any part of your family. Now, 
this particular spreadsheet has two islands because, in fact, I'm stuck. I have an ancestor of mine whose name is Wilhelm. His name is Johann Wilhelm Heinrich. And his wife's name is Wife, <laughs> which makes it difficult to make much progress there. And he baptizes a son in Carlisle in 1811. And I know absolutely nothing else about him. He does not appear in any other document that I have been able to find. The only other family with that surname in that location at that time is the fellow who was the source person in the spreadsheet, John Henry, who settled in Henry Valley and uh, came from Germantown in Pennsylvania. And I know a fair amount about his family. And those are the two islands, the parts of my own ancestry that I'm pretty sure of, going back to this old Father William, whose wife is named Wife, um, and the family of John Henry, who came from Germantown, trying to find some link somewhere. And the link is currently um, elusive. So that's why there are two islands in this particular spreadsheet, and I haven't found a bridge yet. But um, the union says, okay, you want to do that, you go ahead and do that, but it's going to show you that you have two separate groups. And I say, yeah, yeah, I know, that's the problem. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's look over here at this part a little bit. And I wanted to go here. Okay, I'm kind of deliberately going to go for, I'd like, a, okay, a granddaughter, that's good, yeah. This is the tree view. This is, this is the way um, you often find, uh, this, this is sometimes called a pedigree chart, which always made me think of, you know, racehorses or something, but there it is. This is a pedigree chart, and uh, so here's our source person here. And so this is the person that I picked and said, show me a tree for this person, a tree, tree view for this person. So there's her parents, and there's her paternal grandparents. Her maternal grandparents aren't in the file yet. And then there's great-grandparents, and that's as far as the file goes. Um, the union does not have, well, there probably is a limit. I think it's 99 generations. That, that should be about enough. Yeah, there's also a limit on the number of spouses. I think it's 150. Now, this program does have a certain slant toward the Mormon church, but I still think 150 is still plenty. Okay. So now we'll look at charts a little bit, a descendant chart. So you can see I can go as many as 99 generations. I don't have 99 generations down. So here's our source person and his spouse. And this spreads out quite a bit because whenever you have um, one of his kids where you have grandchildren, it makes space for all of the grandchildren. And it's color coded and you can print it out and it will go down as far as you have kids. So this is going from the um, from as far back in time as you have getting more and more close to the present. Whereas the tree view went the other way around. It started with a person and went back in time. So this is the inverse kind of view. The 
there's this kind of interesting thing called a timeline. And this is kind of a summary of the database. And so each person has a line that shows when they were born and when they died. And the curved, curved end here, the rounded end, means that it's a female person. And if the ends are squared off, then it's a male person. And in both of those cases, the dates are, are um, pretty well known. So if I double click on that, it tells me that the birth date is, I put it in with a question mark, but I put in an actual year. So I'm pretty sure about that. But um, the reason there's a question mark is that when he gave a deposition about his Revolutionary War service, he was just a little bit unclear about what year he was born. But he was in his 80s by that time. But I do have an actual death date. Now, if it's a diagonal line, that means that I don't have a, a death date. I have here, this is a, a female, and I have an actual birth record. But I don't have any death record. And what this program is assuming is that until you get to be 110, it's going to assume that you're alive unless I state otherwise. And you can change that limit. The default value is 110. That's, that's why people have these long lines. Now, down here, this is things that happened to this, to our source person at different times during his life. He was born when he was five years old, his mother died. When he was 26 years old, he got married. So these are all the things that I know about this person. If you're really, really lucky, you can kind of map your ancestor's life in some detail. The ideal would be, of course, to have some recorded event for every year of his or her life. I don't think there are records of every year of my life that I know about that somebody could find, so that's an idealistic goal but it shows you maybe where you have gaps. And if I go over here, these are the events for his wife. And so if I go to the family view and simply arbitrarily pick another person and say, tell me about ages there, I have far less information about this person. This is, this is all that I have. So you can find that. Um, you can make a, a, an individual timeline with some detail for any particular person. And I think maybe unless you have questions that we've probably done enough of this. The rest of we get into finer and finer detail about how this program works. And honestly, it's like most stuff that comes on your Mac computer. You know, it's pretty intuitive. It works the way you think it should work. No, no, no. This is fairly expensive. Yes. Yes, you can get a free trial. I think the free trial, uh, I'm not sure if there's a time limit on it, and I think it does everything but print. I'm not sure about that. Does it? Yeah, I don't know. I started off with Reunion 4. And Did you? 
How did I what? This is this is a piece of software. Ancestry.com is a company. And they make them up so that somebody can read them. They're probably yes. printed on both sides. Yes. And anybody and everybody can go and mess around with your family tree if you load it up to Ancestry. They can make changes in it. Yeah, they actually can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any luck? Ah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the Bibles are good. The stories, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. That can be very satisfying. Yes, yes. It has been my experience working with Ancestry.com. I, I use it a lot. It has been my experience that there are a lot of idiots out there and about 80% of the data is wrong. Because people just copy and they don't think. probably means that that person can't see any of you either because you use the same thing. So it, it looks like reunion itself, um, full license is $99 and an upgrade is 50 Maybe that's 49.95 is to upgrade from a previous version. Yeah, there's there's separate licenses for each type of device. Yeah, it's the forty forty nine dollars to upgrade from a previous version to the current version. 
and then reunion for uh, iDevice is 10 bucks. Now, Ralph, does that work independently or does it tie into the other? Looks like it works independently. It doesn't tie into the desktop version. Oh no, it is a companion. Yeah, so you can you can save your uh, data through Dropbox yeah, and then work between your computer and your and your iDevice. Because it's usually well, it's often easier to carry your iPad around when you're you know playing the grave sites and churches and looking through yeah. records than your whole computer. Right. You can add pictures into reunion. Um, we have something like um, 300 members, but many of those are out of town. Um, they don't come to meetings. Uh, the society meets monthly on the third Thursday of the month. Uh, currently at um, the Clover Center, and there is a computer interest group that meets on the second Thursday of the month, so that would be tomorrow. And there's also a DNA interest group. There's um, a writer's group for people who are thinking about maybe writing a sketch of one of their ancestors or actually writing a genealogy, that sort of thing. No, no, the meetings are open to the public. And if you are a visitor, in fact, uh, the first time you come, they will ask you who you're researching in case somebody else in the room is also researching that family name. And they'll give you a little folder with um, genealogical freebie gifts in it. No, no, the computer interest group is, is um, at the Westfall Road Mormon Church, but the membership, the monthly membership meeting is at the Clover Center. It's, it used to be called the Baptist Temple. I'm sorry? When, when it's the, the 20th? The second, the s yeah, the, the second Thursday is for the computer interest group and the DNA interest group. And the third Thursday at the Clover Center, that's the monthly membership meeting. And at those meetings, there's a, a short program, a half an hour, some kind of a tutorial or, or that sort of thing. And then, um, as with your meeting, a break. And then the main speaker. Um, they don't meet in December, though. Yeah, I think it's $25. Could be wrong about that. I don't pay a lot of attention to that. <laughs> or a one time fee for 500 So if you're going to live for more than 20 years, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Miriam, and thank you. Uh, very nice. Thank you. It's all uh, it's all interesting to see. My my mother's brother traced her family back to the Mayflower, and uh, they said they had to go to England to uh, to go back any farther. <sighs> this Robert Burdick, I think. But we've got a book somewhere that he gave to all the the kids and grandkids and. Got to find it. I think my sister knows where hers is. <laughs> I got into genealogy because my grandmother gave me a book, which was a genealogy of her family. She opened this book and she said, now that's my mother. And this was the ancestry of 
it, it was the family of William White in the Mayflower. Okay? And so I thought, no, it's a lie. It's a lie. The people who wrote that book, two of the, two of the White brothers, were, were so desirous. It was close to the centennial. They wanted to be descended from William White of the Mayflower so bad they could taste it. They made it up. They had an ancestor of theirs, William White. They had another William White who was born in Boston. They said, that's our ancestor. He moved to New Hampshire, and he died in New Hampshire, and he's our great-great-grandfather. So I go, and being a scientist, I'm going to check everything. And so I go, and I check Scientists sometimes look for things that aren't there because, you know, they're not supposed to be there. William White was born in Boston. He died in Boston. There were two men called William White. I'm descended from Nicholas White, who owned the first iron foundry in the Boston area. He made lots of bullets for the Revolutionary War, but I have no Mayflower ancestors. Uh, Bob, what time did you want to get together on Sunday? Two? All right. So if anyone's interested, uh, 2 o'clock at Bob's house, give him a call so he knows if anyone's coming. So we'll see you all next uh, next month for Adam Engst and uh, whatever new he wants to talk about. And thank you all for coming. Uh huh. Yes.